Without a father, we miss out on a protector, provider, role model, and many of the positive benefits of dad. Going without such an important figure in our lives could be very destructive to our upbringing. However, following the traits of Elijah, any father can be more prepared, and any child may know their father in heaven. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Ryken, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. We're in a verse-by-verse study of the life of Elijah. In today's message, we'll finish that study by realizing what an important figure Elijah was and how his biblical legacy in both the Old and New Testaments continues to have a large impact on our lives. Well, Phil, with today's message, we finish our four-month study of Elijah. However, we don't find ourselves in either of the books of Kings as we've been in the past. Instead, we're looking into the book of Malachi, the last few verses of the Old Testament. Why are we there? You know, Mark, we're committed on this program to teach every last word, and I wanted to follow the story of Elijah right through to the end of the Old Testament, because right at the end of Malachi, there's this wonderful promise that Elijah will come again, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. I mean, how could we miss a message on that great verse? Well, today's title is, When is Daddy Coming Home? Let me ask you a personal question about the ways your father molded you into the man you've become today. Well, Mark, I think anyone that knows both me and my father would immediately recognize so many ways that I I really am my father's son. I mean, so many things that I'm interested in, literature, the Puritans, theology, even the St. Louis Cardinals. I mean, there's so many uh, things that are important to my father that are also important to me. But, you know, I think the most important thing is the most important thing in the ministry of Elijah, and that is that my father is a man whose heart is committed to God. And when you have someone whose heart is committed to God, then his heart will also be committed to his children. And that's really the message of these wonderful verses from the end of the Old Testament, the end of the story of Elijah. Thanks, Phil. Let's turn in our Bibles now to Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, and listen to God's word for us today. Now, there is a question that is asked day after day, in millions of homes across America. When is daddy coming home? When is daddy coming home? The reason that question is asked is because good fathers bring a joy and a peace to the home that no one else can bring, only fathers. I knew this joy and peace as a son In the evening, as the shadows would grow long across the driveway, I would pause in the middle of my basketball game and I would gaze down to the end of Howard Street to see if the familiar form of my father was coming home with his briefcase. Or I would sit in my room with my ear half listening for the sound of my father at the door, the turning of the handle and the banging of the screen and the footstep in the hall. Daddy's home. And I now sense that same joy and peace now that I am the daddy who brings the briefcase to the door. For as soon as I turn the key in the lock and snap the deadbolt open, I will hear the cries of delight and the shouts of acclamation and the thubbity, thubbity, thubbity of little feet in the hall. And as I walk past, some little person will grab onto my leg and will not let go. And what that little person wants is not so much my leg, but my heart, the heart of a father. You see, this is God's plan for joy and peace in the family. Fathers bring a security to the home which no one else can bring, only a father. And so in a recent article, Dr. Marlon Howe lists the blessings that a good father brings to the home. He protects, he provides, he plays. He shows his children how to be independent, how to trust, and how to work. And more than anyone else, he teaches his sons what it means to be men. And, interestingly, his daughters what it means to be women. 
So how concludes that involved fathers, especially biological fathers, bring positive benefits to their children that no other person is likely to bring. When the father's heart is turned towards home, his children are blessed. Home is where the father's heart is. And if home is where the father's heart is, then that explains why so many of our homes are in trouble. Americans are finding out today what it means to live life without father. The titles of recent books on fatherhood read like a litany of paternal failure, the search for lost fathering, missing from action, life without father, or simply this book, No Fathers. David Blankenhorn begins his book, Fatherless America, with these alarming words. The United States is becoming an increasingly fatherless society. A generation ago, an American child could reasonably expect to grow up with his or her father. Today, an American child can reasonably expect not to. Fatherlessness is now approaching a rough parity with fatherhood as a defining feature of American childhood. Tonight, about... 40% of American children will go to sleep in homes in which their fathers do not live. Before they reach the age of 18, more than half of our nation's children are likely to spend at least a significant portion of their childhoods living apart from their fathers. Never before in this country have so many children been voluntarily abandoned by their fathers. And never before have so many children grown up without knowing what it means to have a father. But if anything, the situation that Blankenhorn describes is even worse in Philadelphia, where more than half of our children are born out of wedlock. So our nation has embarked upon this great national experiment to discover what happens to a generation raised without fathers. And the result can only be chaos and brutality on a scale that this culture can hardly imagine. Where, one wonders, will these orphans find the peace and security which only a father's heart can give? Howard Hendricks looks at the statistics and he asks, who is going to model fatherhood for the children of these homes? Who is going to show them what it means for a man to be committed to them? Who is going to teach the boys especially what it means to be a man? And what we might ask about the fathers of the church. For the sins of the culture always find their ways through the doors of the church and then take a seat in the pews. Anger, adultery, abuse, Incest, neglect, prayerlessness, all these sins also happen within the families of the church. And you see, it was the same in Malachi's day. The hearts of the fathers had turned away from their children. Some were too wrapped up in their work to spend time with their families. Some were too ungodly to provide spiritual direction for the home. Some were too angry to treat their children with anything except curses and brutality. And so Malachi looked around at the men of Judah and he saw, and this is Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, that they had covered themselves with violence as well as with a garment. And worst of all, divorce was rampant. Some fathers had bailed out on their families altogether. So Malachi asks in verse 10, Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? And again in verse 14, The Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. And surely at the same time that the hearts of the fathers had turned away from their children, the hearts of the children had turned away from their fathers. Malachi does not tell us quite how the children were behaving, but it is not hard to guess. With such fathers, most likely they were rebellious and resentful. And that is where the Old Testament ends. 
It ends with a family in crisis and with a nation in crisis, because as the family goes, so goes the nation. The hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the children had turned away from one another. And what the people need is another Elijah. That is what Malachi promises in these last two verses of the Old Testament. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. What the people of God needed then and what they need now is another Elijah. Another Elijah, you say. What an odd thing for Malachi to promise. Admittedly, Elijah was a great prophet, but what did he know or do about the family? There is little or nothing about fatherhood in what the Bible tells us from the ministry and life of Elijah. We are not told, for example, who Elijah's father was. Nor are we told if Elijah was a father himself, although we have reasons to suspect that he was not. He was a sort of father figure to the widow's son in Zarephath, but only for a little while. And then again, he was a sort of father figure to Elisha. But he was also the one who called Elisha to leave his father and to leave his mother to go into the ministry. And so it is hard to figure out what, if anything, Elijah did for the family. And what, we might ask, would a second Elijah do to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children? The best answer to this question is that the prophet Elijah would turn the hearts of the people back to God. The fathers and the children cannot turn their hearts towards one another until they are first turned towards God, and that is what the ministry of Elijah was all about, turning hearts back to God. That is what he did, you may remember, on the Mount Carmel. There he stood in front of all the prophets of Baal and all the people of Israel, and he challenged them to turn either one way or the other. He said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So the prophets of Baal prepared a bull on their altar, and they sang their song, and they danced their dance, but they failed to call down fire from heaven. And then Elijah stepped forward with his sacrifice, and he prayed this heart-warming, heart-turning prayer. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back Again, notice that phrase, Elijah prayed that God would turn the hearts of his people back to God. And God answered that prayer. When the fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, all the people fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They turned their faces and their hearts back to God. And so when Elijah comes, the first thing he will do is turn the hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the children back to God. For there must be this Godward turn in the father's heart before there can be a homeward turn. The father needs to get things straightened out with God before he can get things straightened out with his kids. You cannot have a right relationship with your family until you have a right relationship with God. And what it means to turn your heart back to God is to repent for your sins. You see, repentance is a change of direction, a turning. It means turning your heart away from sin and towards God. 
And for the father, that means turning away from the idols of career. It means turning away from greed. It means turning away from pride, turning away from sexual sin. And above all, it means turning away from self. That is really what our problem is, isn't it, fathers? That we are selfish. We are willing to serve our wives and our children when it fits in with what we already want to do. But when was the last time you joyfully and willingly made a genuine sacrifice for your family? And yet that is what it means to have a heart turned towards your children. It means putting their needs far above your own. I suppose that we could go on and speak further about the sins of the fathers. But I will stop there because I know as a father that even mentioning the topic of fatherhood can bring feelings of guilt and inadequacy and regret. I witnessed this at the Promise Keepers Clergy Conference in Atlanta in 1995. One of the speakers stood up and told us that he was going to talk about the minister and his family. And instantly, the entire stadium got a lump in its throat. You could feel and sense that that was what was happening. And by the time the session was over, there were long lines at all the concourses by the payphones, pastors phoning home, many in tears, to recommit themselves to their families, to their wives, and to their children. You see, first their hearts had been turned back to God, and then their hearts had been turned back home. And so let the Holy Spirit do the same thing in your heart and in your home this morning. Fathers, if you confess your sins To your Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, God will freely forgive you. And he will begin to restore that joy and peace which your family rightly deserves. Now, turning your heart towards God also means turning to God in prayer. Elijah's ministry was supremely a ministry of prayer. And that is the way that he turned hearts back to God through prayer. Again and again we have come back to what the Apostle James in chapter 5 says about Elijah. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly. Elijah's own heart was turned to God in fervent prayer and then His prayers helped turn the hearts of his people back to God. And so when the prophet Elijah comes, he will turn the hearts of the fathers and the children back to God through prayer. Prayer is what turns a father's heart back to his children. Sometimes that happens through the prayers of others. If you see a father whose heart has turned away from his family and has turned toward his own work and his own hobbies and his own interests, then pray for that man. Pray earnestly, the way Elijah did, that the Holy Spirit would turn the man's heart back to God and then back to his children. Sometimes the father's heart is turned through his own prayers. As he turns to God in prayer, he will learn to have God's heart for his family. In his book on parenting, Andrew Murray points out that we bend all our efforts to teach our children to obey, and then we must teach our children to delight to obey. And then you see we have a problem. We cannot teach our children how to delight to obey. We can't do that any more than we can teach them how to become a Christian. True obedience, true Christianity is a spiritual matter. It's a spiritual thing, and spiritual things must be prayed down from heaven through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I suppose that many fathers among us will say, I know that I should pray for my children, but I don't have the time to do it. Or perhaps more honestly, 
I really don't know how to do it. Well, at least do this. For the sake of your children, and for the sake of your grandchildren, and for the sake of your great-grandchildren after them, at least pray for your children whenever you think of them during the day. Offer a short prayer for their salvation, or for their safety, or for their sanctification. Pray about those specific areas of character where your children most need the influence of the Holy Spirit. There is no one else in the whole world who knows how to pray for your son or your daughter better than you do. So pray for them as often as you worry about them. And the more you pray for them, the more your heart will incline in their direction. Now, I am speaking most to fathers this morning because Malachi's promise is about fathers and because the future of our church and our nation rests upon our fathers most of all. But the Lord calls each one of us to guard the hearts of the fathers of the church. And so wives, love your husbands. Respect their spiritual authority in the home and do nothing to undermine it. If you will not respect your husband, your children will not respect their father or you. Ask yourself this question, what can I do to help my husband become a loving father? How can I organize the life in our household so that he can best become a good daddy? Children, love your fathers. Do not get angry with them or argue with them or complain about them or make fun of them. I wonder if the Holy Spirit is showing some of you this morning that there is something cold in your heart toward your dad. Let the Holy Spirit soften your heart and turn it towards your father. Love him, obey him, and serve him. Singles, remember that God has a father's heart for orphans. And if you have a heart for God, then his heart will become your heart, and you will have a heart for orphans. Look for those children who need a friendship that leads to spiritual maturity, especially boys and girls without fathers. Find a family in the church who needs practical help. And you will find that if you make a commitment to serve and to love a family, you will be such a blessing to them that they will welcome you into the love of their home. Grandparents, pray for your grandchildren. In the economy of God, you have a special responsibility to pray for your descendants. Remember how you used to say that you didn't have much time to pray? Well, now you do have time, many of you. And the fathers and the children need your prayers more than ever. Now, what will happen if the fathers do not turn their hearts back to God and back to their children? Have you ever noticed that the Old Testament ends with an or else? God says that the prophet Elijah will come and turn hearts towards home, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Our own nation now lives under such a curse. The hearts of the fathers have turned away from the children, and the or else is upon us. Abuse, crime, delinquency, divorce, neglect. But that's not the worst of it. The curse is only beginning. For Malachi 4 begins with these chilling words. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Malachi here describes the curse of final judgment. He prophesies the coming of that 
great and terrible day of the Lord, the day when the fire of God's wrath will destroy every wicked person. And then every father who turned his heart away from his children will be cursed. And every child who turned his or her heart away from his or her father will be cursed. And every person who has turned a heart away from God will be cursed. And if you know your own heart and the tendency of your own heart, the way that it loves to turn away from God, then those are frightening words. Especially, I would say, for fathers. Somewhere deep in the heart of every Christian father, there is a passionate desire to be a good father. But somewhere deep in the conscience of every Christian father, there is a painful awareness of paternal failure. We know that out of all the world, God has given us this wife, these children, this little family to love. We also know that on the day of judgment, the sins of the fathers will be brought to account including our own sins. If Elijah will come before that great and dreadful day, he better hurry up and get here before it is too late. Well, if you know the scriptures, you know the wonderful truth that that Elijah has already come. The Old Testament closes with this promise that Elijah will come, and then the New Testament opens with the coming of that Elijah. This is what the Lord said to Zechariah the priest, and I am reading now out of Luke chapter 1, and I encourage you to turn there with me. Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 13. This is what the angel said, "'Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard.'" Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist was that second Elijah. Jesus said the same thing to his disciples. He said, if you are willing to accept it, John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. Matthew 11, verse 14. Jesus called John Elijah because he did just what Malachi promised. Notice the words that Luke uses to describe John's ministry, and notice the order he puts them in. First, John will bring many people back to the Lord, their God. And then he will go on in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And that, of course, is just what Elijah did. First, he turned hearts back to God, and then he turned hearts back home. And furthermore, John did this just the way Elijah would have done it. Remember how John the Baptist went around preaching. He said, repent. That is, turn around, change your direction, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John understood that turning back to God means turning away from sin. And it was the wonderful, the way that John the Baptist turned the hearts of the fathers to their children. But you know, the ministry of John the Baptist was just a sort of warm-up act for the ministry of Jesus Christ. John was preparing the way for someone better and bigger. Malachi said the same thing at the beginning of Malachi 3. He said, see, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And that messenger, of course, was John the Baptist. But Malachi went on to say this. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant 
whom you desire will come. And then you see Malachi was speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Lord he meant. And so if John the Baptist was the one who began to turn hearts towards home, then Jesus Christ is the one to keep them there. John was the Elijah to prepare the way for the Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who has brought us into the loving heart of God the Father. You know, as I preach about fathers this morning, I realize that for some of you, even the word father conjures up painful memories. I think, first of all, of you single mothers, for whom it is hard to listen to all the statistics about fatherless America without worrying about your own children. For you know that no matter how hard you try to be a good parent, there is at least one thing that you cannot do for your children. You cannot be a father to them. And then I think of all the men and women even perhaps some of the boys and girls among us who have never had a good father. Some fathers are so cold or so cruel that their children grow up to fear them. And so it is that when they open their Bibles and read that God is their father, they are not quite sure that God is safe. And so if thinking about Fathers is painful. I want to remind you, whoever you are, that you have a good daddy. If you are a single mother who trusts in Christ, then you are God's daughter. And if you are God's daughter, then your children have a good father. You have brought your children under the care of your father in heaven. And so God himself is that Father who alone can bring joy and peace to your home. You need to remind yourself and your children who your father is. And so when you pray, you say, Our Father. And when you make a decision within the household, you say, We better talk to our father about this. And when your children need to be disciplined, you tell them that behavior is not pleasing to your father. For if you are a Christian, then there is always a father living in your home. And if you have never had a good father, I want to give you one right now. Jesus once told a story about the father love of God. I like to call it the story of the prodigal God, the God who squandered his love on wayward children. In the story, the youngest son turns his heart away from his father, and he asks for a sack of gold from the family estate, and he runs as far away from home as he can, and then he wastes his father's money doing all the things that parents hope their children will never do. He ends up hungry and homeless, fighting with pigs for his dinner. And then he remembers how well his father treated his servants, and especially how well fed they were. And so he slouches back home, no longer a son, but longing to be a servant. And when he gets home, he finds that his father's heart has never turned away from him. So when that father sees his son coming from a long way off, he runs to meet him and he gives him a big hug. He puts a beautiful robe around his shoulders and he gives him a golden ring and then he throws the biggest party that anyone could remember. That story is about the love of God the Father. His heart is always turned toward his children and it is never turned away. God is a good, good daddy, and he keeps loving you and loving you 
and loving you until you are ready to call him Daddy. The work of Jesus Christ is to bring us to the Father so that even those who have never known such love can know the love of a father's heart. And if you have never called God's father, then I invite you to become his child this morning. Your father is waiting for you with open arms and a heart turned towards you. All you need to do is believe in Jesus Christ and you will have that father's love. You do not need to ask when Daddy is coming home, for he is home already waiting with his heart turned towards you. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we praise you that you are our Father and that you turn towards us with the love of a Father's heart that never turns away. We give you praise that we can be brought into that love through the work of Jesus Christ. And we pray this morning especially for the fathers among us that they would be fathers like you are a father, with their hearts turned towards their children. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to Every Last Word, a ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, featuring the Bible teaching of Dr. Philip Graham Ryken. We appreciate your ongoing support of this broadcast ministry. The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades, even centuries gone by, we seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. The Alliance also produces the radio broadcasts The Bible Study Hour, featuring the teaching of the late Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, and Dr. Barnhouse in the Bible, featuring the Bible teaching of the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. For a full list of radio stations carrying our programs, please visit our website at www.alliancenet.org. Every last word continues through your generous gifts and financial support. If you would like to see this program continue to benefit others as it has benefited you, please prayerfully consider becoming a friend of the Alliance. For more information or to make a contribution, please contact us by calling toll-free 1-800-488-1888. You can also send us a gift by writing to Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at www.alliancenet.org. Be sure to ask for a free resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to Every Last Word.